The universe is a giant jigsaw puzzle made up of an infinite number of pieces. We can only see a small part of it and can only guess at the rest. The cosmic abyss hides a huge number of mysteries and riddles and there are still a lot of them up ahead for us to unravel. Let's go on a fantastic virtual journey through the vastness of the universe and probe the very fundamentals of its existence. To begin with, we will delve into the depths of primordial chaos to understand how the cosmic order around us is formed from it and try to explain it using the anthropic principle. And then we'll try to answer this question. Why are we still not receiving signals from civilizations in other worlds out there? Are we alone in the universe? Or is there really some other intelligent life somewhere in its depths? The power of imagination will reveal to us fantastic spacecraft that are able to cross interstellar space. They will help us get as far as the outermost borders of the universe and then venture beyond to see what lies further out. This journey will end in the distant future and will show us what the death of our universe will be like. Let's get ready and we begin. One flap of a butterfly's wing in Brazil would be enough to cause a hurricane in Indonesia. Edward Norton Lorenz 1893 Kyoto, Japan Young lawyer Henry Stimson and his wife Mabel White are on their honeymoon in Kyoto. The newlyweds are stunned by the colorful oriental city and its ancient history. They will remember this visit for the rest of their lives. May 11, 1945 Los Alamos, USA A special US Army committee makes a list of priority targets for atomic bombings. Kyoto is top on the list as the largest industrial center in Japan. Pointing to the city's large cultural significance, the Minister of Defense, Henry Stimson, crosses it out from the list personally. This makes Hiroshima the main target for the US Army. Next in line at risk of bombing is the town of Kukura. August 9, 1945, Japan the crew of the US Air Force B-29 bomber is given a specially important order by the commanders. The military arsenal in Kukura must be raised to the ground. A state-of-the-art bomb, more powerful than any used before, is loaded on board the aircraft for the mission. However, the town is enveloped in a fog so thick that the crew cannot distinguish the target. The aircraft captain Charles Sweeney takes a decision to fly on. To the town of Nagasaki. Thus some sentimental reminiscences of 50 years back and an ordinary weather event affected the destinies of millions of people. And this story is just one of a great multitude of examples where seemingly small events may give rise to major consequences incredible in their scale. This phenomenon is commonly perceived as the butterfly effect. But in reality, it is actually just a part of a big field of science known as chaos theory. In order to have a clearer insight into the correlation between small arthropods and destructive weather events, let's travel back to the recent past. In 1961, mathematician and meteorologist Edward Lorenz attempted to forecast the behavior of atmospheric flows by means of computer modeling. The scientist assumed that thanks to new computing capabilities, he would be able to predict the weather with an unprecedented accuracy. However, the results of the calculations baffled the scientist. In order to try to speed up the calculation process, Lorenz divided it into stages, so that the final results of the previous stage would be the starting conditions for the one coming next. Some of the resulting figures were slightly rounded up by the computer. This was so negligible 
that it was not supposed to have any significant impact on the final answer. Or so the scientist thought. However, in reality it turned out that the results of uninterrupted and stage-by-stage -stage calculations differed dramatically. Later studies revealed that the system of equations Lorenz was trying to solve was inadequate for atmospheric processes modeling. Still, as is often the case in science, a misformulated task proved to be a step to an amazing and unexpected discovery. In his search for answers, the mathematician found that all possible solutions of the system group around two conventional positions which he dubbed attractors. If every solution were to be represented by a dot in a 3D coordinate system, they eventually form a shape reminiscent of a butterfly's wings. Interestingly, the slightest change of any initial parameter may sharply transfer the final calculation result from one wing to the other. In fact, Lorenz was not the first to discover an effect like that. Similar ideas were expressed by German philosopher Johann Fichte and French mathematician Henri Poincaré in their works. Be it as it may, it was Lorenz who transformed the annoying error of mathematical modeling into a potent and elaborate theory capable of offering answers to many questions. It goes without saying that hundreds of scientists would have contributed to the notion of chaos in the decades that followed, and the theory itself has come a long way. Its mechanisms can be applied to describe such complex phenomena and processes as turbulent flows, evolution of biological species, social interactions and stock exchange quotes. The laws of chaos define the movement of celestial objects and explosions of stars, the birth of empires and the demise of continents. And in order to get to the bottom of these factors and regularities, first and foremost, the notion of chaos has to be defined from the point of view of science. First of all, it should be noted that any chaotic structure is subject to rather rigid and clear physical laws, but they are so complex that the behavior of a system appears to be unpredictable. It is for a reason that structures like that are also known as deterministic chaos, with reference to their behavior being predefined. This is the principal feature that distinguishes them from stochastic systems, which are based on truly random events. If a chaotic system's behavior is supervised several times, the initial conditions being absolutely identical, it will react in the same manner. As for a structure based on pure chance, meanwhile, the result will never be the same. For example, experiments show that the decay of unstable nuclei in a sample of radioactive material occurs exclusively by chance. We can calculate the approximate number of atoms transforming within a specified period of time, but at the current stage of technological development, it is impossible to predict the precise time a given nucleus is supposed to decay. The exact mathematical definition of chaos sounds like this. A system has to exhibit non-linear characteristics, be globally stable, but at the same time have at least one oscillating equilibrium point. At the same time, the system's fractal dimension must not be less than 1.5, it's quite a challenge to get one's head around this convoluted phrase, unless one is a professional mathematician, of course, rather than a layman. In simple words, it may be expressed by three principal points. Firstly, the system has to be non-linear. Let's imagine we're influencing a structure in one way or another and getting a predictable feedback. It is logical to assume that after several interactions of this kind, the resulting change will equal the sum of all single ones. However, it isn't the case for a non-linear system, and as a result, the structure will change more or less than we estimated. This was the effect encountered by Lorenz in his calculations, which prompted him to carry on with his studies. Secondly, a dynamic chaos system must be responsive to the initial conditions, that is to exhibit this very butterfly effect. This means that no matter how tiny and almost completely negligible change of the initial conditions may be, it may force the system to develop in a completely different manner. Thirdly, as a system develops, its separate parts are supposed to overlap and interact with each other. Such interactions are usually not taken into account in classical physics. However, quite often it proves to be a grave omission. 
It is keeping track of multifaceted influence that makes chaos theory models so elaborate and so like real structures. Let's think 13.8 billion years back. Just a few quanta of time would have elapsed since the occurrence of the hypothetical Big Bang. There is neither matter nor energy around us as we know them and the four fundamental interactions are interconnected by one bizarre force. The physical laws known to us are not yet applicable at this point. However, other ones are working instead, which are just as rigid and which predefine the system's future development. At the same time, a tiniest change in any point of the germinating universe is capable of changing its future completely, whatever the reason for this tiny change. It appears that our reality was literally born actually thanks to chaos, in the scientific sense of the word. Now let's imagine what it's like about a million years later. The space of that time would have become more like what we know it to be, although there aren't any stars or planets around. There are only countless clouds of primary hydrogen floating around the young universe. The hydrogen is exposed to gravity forces pressure. This forms gravity centers which are soon to become the first stars. These gas clusters are splashed about quite irregularly with no system to speak of. They are also massive enough to mutually exert gravitational influence. At the same time, with any of the protostars moved aside, or with its mass slightly altered, these changes will influence not only its own evolution, but that of its immediate neighbors as well. This means that the laws of chaos continue to rule the universe. In the course of billions of years that followed, primary stars burned out and exploded, saturating the universe with heavy elements. New stars were born from clusters of hydrogen, with clouds of cosmic dust near them swirling in gigantic vortices and forming protoplanetary disks. It is easy to see the already familiar patterns of chaotic movement and interaction in their structure. And this is how four and a half billion years ago the solar system was born. The yellow dwarf, which is known as the Sun and which gives us light and warmth every single second, is located on the periphery of the Milky Way. As it orbits around the center of our galaxy, it follows the so-called co-rotation circle. This means that the rate of our Sun's movement accurately follows the rotation of the galaxy's spiral arms, which are stellar nurseries. Thanks to this fascinating synchronization, the solar system hardly ever crosses the arms thus keeping a safe distance away from harmful supernova flares and the heat of active stars. The diameter of this galactic orbit matters too. If the Sun were to lie closer to the center of the Milky Way, the great abundance of heavy elements would have rendered the forming planets too large and massive. Besides, the galactic core's powerful ionizing radiation would have thwarted any attempts of life to evolve and propagate on the surfaces of the planets and their satellites. On the other hand, the further from the galactic center, the much poorer the chemical diversity of elements. In this case, rocky planets of a rich chemical composition like our Earth would never have been able to form. The Sun would have been orbited solely by gas giants or icy giants at best. There are some exciting coincidences easily noticeable within the solar system too. For example, consider this. The Earth lies the ideal distance from the Sun and follows a stable orbit with a small eccentricity. Our planet's orbital trajectory is remarkably close to an ideal circle. If the trajectory's diameter shifted as little as 5% in any direction, the planet would either become icebound or would be shrouded in a dense cloud of water vapor. The bottom line is that any advanced life forms would cease to exist. In addition, the Sun itself has a number of extremely important features. It is neither too hot nor too cold and its life expectancy is considerably long. Even though there forms a wide habitable zone around a hot star, its life expectancy is generally small. Also, its ionizing radiation is much too powerful. Colder stars like red dwarfs, on the other hand, are capable of sustaining a habitable zone too narrow and generally too close to themselves. 
That is why, more often than not, planets within this zone are tidally locked to their star, and so are not equally heated up, with the temperatures on the two sides drastically different. Someone will probably offer a counter-argument here to this effect. It isn't the Earth that adapted to host humans, but rather life adapted to the conditions already present here. This is a rather sensible point, although if we delve deeper into the structure of the universe, there are some facts that cannot be accounted for by this statement. First of all, it should be mentioned that celestial bodies can have stable orbits only in three-dimensional space. In dimensions other than that, the orbits of electrons in a substance's atoms become unstable. In other words, electrons and atoms either collapse to the core or fly away into space. Thus, atoms cannot exist in a multidimensional space. A universe of this sort would only have radiation and freely floating elementary particles. Another point to consider is that there are several fundamental values that all contemporary physics is based on. They usually include the speed of light, the gravitational constant, the Planck's constant, the elementary charge, and the masses of the electron and the proton. All these values have been arrived at experimentally and today are considered to be mutually independent. However, modern science cannot say why these values are exactly like that and no other way. It is known that a free electron is a bit heavier than a proton and electron system. Without this inequality, there would be no hydrogen around, because otherwise its atom would immediately turn into a neutron. By the same token, with no hydrogen around, no stars would be able to form in the universe, and heavier elements would never exist either. With the values of the Coulomb interaction and the powerful interaction slightly different from those gauged today, no thermonuclear synthesis reactions in stars' interiors would be possible. With an increased gravitational constant, stars would compress far too strongly. This would inevitably produce a great plethora of large and hot stars with a short lifespan. After they burned out, most matter in the universe would be buried inside black holes and neutron stars, never to become material to help form planets, satellites and other space objects. By contrast, with a decreased gravitational constant, interstellar gas would not be compressed enough to make thermonuclear reactions self-sufficient. In this case, stars would simply never flare up, and the universe would be filled with giant brown dwarfs this time. A change in the electromagnetic interaction coefficient in any direction would render chemical reactions and complex compounds virtually non-existent. On the other hand, if the Coulomb interaction were stronger than it is now, there would be no elements heavier than boron around. Their nuclei would simply be torn apart by protons' electromagnetic repulsion. Heavy elements can form in the universe thanks exclusively to a number of factors favorably combined. Here are some more exciting coincidences. Consider this. It is thanks to a special state of carbon that helium is able to transform into it. Known as carbon resonance, this phenomenon plays a crucial role in the formation of heavy elements and their spreading across the universe. It is thanks to carbon resonance that stars go supernova and shed their outer layers. Atoms born in their interiors are scattered across space to form planets, satellites, asteroids and other celestial bodies. Besides, carbon is vital for the genesis of life. Only carbon is able to create long and elaborate chains forming the base for and forking out into incredibly diverse chemical compounds. Life as we know it can exist only when based on organic compounds that would never have formed but for carbon. So now it is clear that the universe itself, as well as life in it and intelligent observers, that is humans, came to be only thanks to a number of fascinating and not readily obvious coincidences. Theories that would be able to account for this are usually beyond the scope of physics and are rather to do with philosophy. One of these is referred to as the Anthropic Principle. Even though the term itself was coined only in 1973, the ideas it is based on had been voiced much sooner. For example, we come across this idea in the works of Soviet scientist Grigory Idlis dating back to 1958, where it is expressed to this effect. What we observe is a part of the universe that is not random a priori. 
but one that was made suitable for the genesis and evolution of life by its special structure. This vision is referred to as the weak anthropic principle. Much later on, the so-called strong anthropic principle was formulated, according to which the universe is supposed to have certain properties that are favorable for the evolution of intelligent life, or to put it differently, an observer is needed for the universe to exist. The latter formulation is based on an idea used in quantum physics. The observer plays a crucial role, because their presence dramatically influences the behavior of particles. That is why the observer is indispensable in any quantum physics experiment. We might also see it put this way. The laws of the universe are the way they are because we can exist only in the universe the way it is. The anthropic principle implies that theoretically there may exist other universes out there or else other parts of this single universe that would have a different set of physical laws. However, it is that either mankind is not able to observe those areas or those hypothetical worlds cannot get real without an observer. This assumption may be further developed into a multiverse theory or a hypothesis where basic physical constants may change their values as time goes by. Still, observations of the areas of the universe visible to us show that the fundamental values remain unchanged. The concept of a multiverse defies description in the scope of science. Generally speaking, the anthropic principle lies largely beyond the scope of the scientific view of the world and requires a metaphysical approach. Stanislav Lem commented on this to this effect. It's an attempt to account for the unknown using the unknown. Also, it is evident that the anthropic principle clashes with the mediocrity principle. The latter states that the area of space observable to humans isn't anything extraordinary, and there would be lots and lots of similar stretches within the universe. The Milky Way, for example, doesn't boast any particularly unique structural features and its position in the large-scale structure of the universe doesn't particularly stand out among billions upon billions of other galaxies. In addition, there is the principle of space homogeneity accepted in contemporary physics, which means that natural laws are really the same from point to point in space. The correctness of this postulate is confirmed by countless observations of the world around us. Mankind has been stirred by these questions since times immemorial. Are we alone in the universe? Is our home planet unique? Or are there more Earth-like worlds in the Milky Way? Or is what we see just a kind of backdrops, with whatever there is behind them being something incredible, that would defy our understanding and therefore appears to be carefully concealed from us by the universe? Science cannot give satisfying answers to any of these questions yet, Otherwise, it would probably bring about a downright revolution in our perception of the world and upgrade our cognition to a whole new level. As it is, everyone is entitled to their own personal opinion. According to the theory we'll be looking at today, any intelligent race is bound to face a number of insurmountable obstacles at a certain stage of its development. And the upshot of the development of any civilization is that sooner or later it is to meet its demise, with no traces or evidence of its existence left behind. The hypothesis we'll be talking about is called the Great Filter. To estimate the plausibility of such prospects, we will have to direct our gaze into the future and to speculate about issues likely to be lying in wait ahead of us that we're going to encounter while evolving as a species. The idea of the Great Filter Hypothesis was first put forward by the economist Robin Hansen in 1996. The theory was supposed to account for the Fermi Paradox, something I told you about in one of our earlier videos. According to the author, since there are no traces of extraterrestrial civilizations to be seen in the observable part of the universe, it is doubtful the chances of the birth of intelligent life forms are high and so arguments in favor of this motion have to be seriously questioned. It is feasible that factors as yet unknown to science may impede the evolution of life forms, not allowing them to grow into a civilization advanced enough to venture into the cosmos and become a galactic race. If the hypothesis were to be believed, such like factors may well get in the way of our species too. As for the notion of the Great Filter itself, 
It specifies what some of these obstacles may be like. Chronologically, they can be either in the past, when animals are prevented from evolving to become intelligent species, or in the future, meaning that there is a big hazard of an intelligent civilization almost certainly finding itself on the road to self-destruction. In our case, the concept implies that the easier the evolution has occurred until now, the worse the prospects for humankind appear to be for the future. In other words, if we still haven't had to deal with our great filter, it is highly likely we will yet have to do so at some point. Initially, the hypothesis was met with skepticism. The evolution of species on our planet has been going on rather smoothly, which means that there may well be, or may have been for that matter, similar conditions elsewhere in the universe. In addition to that, the Drake equation shows that in the Milky Way alone there should be at least several dozen advanced civilizations. At least some of them are bound to have got the hang of radio astronomy or constructed spacecraft like our voyages. Consequently, interaction with an alien civilization cannot be that elusive. However, ever since we set out on our search for other intelligent races out there, the universe hasn't dropped as much as a single hint of anybody else dwelling in its vast expanses. The hypothetical great filter may well be the reason for this lack of clues. The hypothesis suggests that the role of the great filter may be played by one or several obstacles an advanced civilization has to power through in the course of its evolution. If a filter of this sort does exist, that should explain why we still haven't received any signals from advanced civilizations from elsewhere in the universe. Incidentally, the hypothesis admits of the possibility of some creatures surviving the Great Filter. To do it successfully, they have to complete several stages. To begin with, their planet has to be in the Goldilocks zone of its parent star. Next, life has to originate and start evolving there with the organisms capable of multiplying using molecules like DNA and RNA. After that, single cells have to evolve into more complex ones, while the evolution of multicellular organisms will be vigorously stimulated. This in its turn should stimulate the development of sexual propagation, which will be good for genetic diversity. Eventually, this will produce yet more elaborate organisms capable of using tools for developing to the level of advanced enough technologies necessary for space colonization. They will then proceed to colonize other worlds and stellar systems to ensure survival and obviate the eventuality of self-destruction. Robin Hansen argues that it is then and only then that the Great Filter will become a thing of the past. Within this concept, at the current stage of evolution, mankind should be bracing up for the most challenging one coming next, when other celestial bodies are going to have to be colonized for the human race to survive. However, it is hardly necessary to point out that the plausibility of going through with this plan is rather small. Robin Hansen maintained that there is a fatal obstacle that an intelligent species encounters at some of the nine steps of its evolution. This is supposed to be something definitive that causes total elimination of the species. Mankind may have completed eight steps of evolution. The chances of successfully completing the ninth are rather slim, and that last step may prove to be that very fatal obstacle. A number of other points are set out in the hypothesis. For example, it specifies measures that must be taken by civilization to eliminate the risk of self-destruction as a result of internal wars, irreversibly detrimental impacts on ecology, and the depletion of natural resources. Apart from the exclusively theoretical benefits offered by this reasoning, it could be really useful for working out our strategies for space exploration. From the perspective of the Great Filter Theory proponents, the discovery of extinct multicellular life forms on Mars should be bad news. It will imply that most of the steps we have completed so far have been comparatively easy. And so the greatest challenge will be posed by the steps still lying ahead of us. That is why the easier hypothetical evolution occurred on other planets, the higher the probability that mankind will never grow to be a spacefaring civilization. But actually, it isn't all doom and gloom. For all we know, 
We may have already negotiated our toughest obstacle at one of the steps already completed. For this reason, some researchers believe that the fact that we appear to be alone in the universe is actually a good sign. This could indicate that we are the lucky few who have passed through the great filter quite unscathed. Still, we can't but admit that people use only several forms of communication, whereas there may be considerably more of them. Either way, the universe is estimated to have existed for 13.8 billion years, and there may well be a great number of organisms out there that would have overcome these obstacles. But hardly any of them will learn that they are not the only ones around. For this, they have to accomplish a major technological breakthrough, which in theory is to be their undoing and lead to a global apocalypse. The situation on our planet demonstrates just that. We are able to eliminate the entire human race as a result of a global thermonuclear war. The odds are rather high that our civilization will be wiped off the face of the Earth before either super-powerful engines or more effective forms of communication have been developed. It is also hard to actually identify the Great Filter, as the environment on other planets may be completely different from ours. For instance, abiogenesis, a process of inorganic nature transforming into organic one, is bizarre and fascinating. And it may actually be the Great Filter for many intelligent races. Given all this, the Great Filter hypothesis prompts a number of important questions. Is mankind going to be able to adequately and successfully respond to an unexpected challenge? Or is the worst already in the past and the silence of the universe is a sign that we are one of the few races to have completed all the stages devised by the Great Filter? Unfortunately, we cannot answer any of this today. It's hardly a secret that distances in the universe are mind-boggling. Even with the best modern engines, a journey to the Moon is going to take several weeks, and more than six months to reach Mars by the most optimal trajectory. If we think about the legendary voyages, after 45 years of traveling through space, they managed to leave only the inner part of the solar system. They are destined to spend several of the next millennia drifting through the scattered disk and the hypothetical Oort cloud. The fastest spacecraft at the moment is the Parker Solar Probe, whose speed in 2025 will reach a record-breaking 194 km per second. However, this will happen only due to the Sun's gravity, which will never allow it to leave the environs of our star, and so the probe is doomed to soon burn up in its photosphere. Apparently, chemical jet engines, which are currently so widespread, have exhausted their development potential and are hardly suitable for interstellar travel. Of course, there are various alternative concepts, such as nuclear pulse propulsion or solar sails, but implementation of either of these is hampered by a number of serious issues. It is highly likely that sooner or later, most of these difficulties will be overcome. Another important task crucial for long-distance travel should be taken into account, namely the creation of a stable and powerful source of energy. All modern spacecraft are relatively small in size and are equipped with reliable but low-power power sources. For example, autonomous research probes are usually powered by isotope batteries, which inevitably degrade over time. If we revisit the legendary voyages, it turns out that almost all of their systems have long since been de-energized and the spacecraft themselves have been moving by inertia for many years. The ISS and other orbiting space stations combine solar panels and radioisotope thermal generators, but most of their power is consumed by life support systems and the iron drives serve only to adjust the orbit. In the case of an extended manned mission to a remote planet or star, however, a spacecraft would need much more power. Meanwhile, 99% of the way to another star inevitably passes through interstellar space, devoid of obvious energy sources. Even radiation of the brightest stars is noticeably weaker here and dissipates in the vast expanses of space. Therefore, to travel to other worlds, we need an autonomous, powerful and preferably inexhaustible source of energy. To figure out a potential way of solving this problem, 
we have to take a closer look at the universe's structure. It is there that a number of amazing physical processes can be observed, which might prove to contain a key to stars' secrets. To do this, we have to take a slight detour. In 2017, a collaborative effort of scientists from Princeton and Hong Kong yielded an incredible device that at first glance violates the fundamental laws of physics. A microscopic mechanism consisting of two toothed silicon plates spaced 100 nanometers apart was able to generate a small amount of energy, literally, from nothing. It would seem that such a phenomenon should grossly violate the law of conservation of energy, one of the fundamental principles of the universe's makeup. However, in fact, it is not as simple as that. The amazing device is based on the Casimir Polder effect discovered back in the middle of last century. Putting it simply, it boils down to this. If two thin plates are placed in a vacuum a very small distance apart, they will begin to be mutually attracted. The phenomenon is closely related to the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, from which follows the existence of the so-called zero-point vacuum fluctuations. They are pairs of virtual particles that constantly appear at any point of the universe, by and large, out of nowhere. However, their lifetime is only 10 to the power of minus 24 seconds, after which the particles disappear back into nothingness and the global balance is restored. At the same time, if virtual particles with any parameters are generated in open space, only those that have strictly defined wavelengths can be generated between the plates. Consequently, more numerous external particles press on the plates harder than internal ones. Just to illustrate, one can imagine that the space between the plates has a negative pressure. It's as if a little more substance were pumped out of the vacuum. The resulting mechanical tension can be transformed into an electric current which is exactly what the Princeton and Hong Kong researchers did. And although the current was quite weak, it's the principle itself that matters. Because this way, our world receives energy virtually from nothing. Even a low-power source of inexhaustible energy is of enormous practical value. For example, as an autonomous power supply for microprocessors and other high-precision equipment. For example, the Voyagers, equipped with such a hypothetical battery, could still transmit data from their instruments to Earth. This opens up promising vistas for exploring deep space. Many interesting physical phenomena follow from the Casimir effect, one of which is the so-called Scharnhorst effect. According to calculations, the speed of light in the space between the plates should exceed the standard value of 300,000 km per second because there are no collisions of photons with virtual particles. Although modern technology does not yet allow this experiment to be carried out, its mathematical justification leads to far-reaching conclusions. For example, the widely known project of the hypothetical superluminal engine known as Alcubierre's bubble was proven to be potentially feasible by scientists from Baylor University, Gerald Cleaver and Richard Abusi. They combined the equations of quantum field theory and the general theory of relativity, producing a complex but clear rationale for a bold concept. It is worth mentioning that according to quantum field theory, space has not three dimensions but many more. But this becomes noticeable only at the level of the microcosm. Applying the equations of this theory to calculate the Casimir effect, the researchers came to the conclusion that it is possible to control its properties with the help of a powerful energy impact. If we condense the space behind the hypothetical starship and make it more rarefied in front, then there appears an area similar to the Alcubierre bubble, which is capable of moving at superluminal speeds. The laws of relativity are not violated here, because it is not the ship itself that is moving, but the space around it. On the other hand, from the very beginning, the main problem of creating such a bubble was considered to be the incredible amount of energy required. According to some calculations, an entire planet must be converted into radiation to form a sphere capable of accommodating a starship. If researchers manage to scale generators based on the Casimir effect to the required capacity, we will be able to obtain energy anywhere in the universe, literally from nothing. 
Of course, there are still many problems to address for a starship to be fully operational, because outer space is not the most friendly environment for humans. For example, it is permeated with deadly radiation, which not only destroys cells of living organisms, but also causes negative mutations in their offspring. Thick metal shields or magnetic fields with certain parameters may be used as protection against it, and both of these approaches have their advantages and disadvantages. Another potential threat could be accidental collisions with micrometeorites and cosmic dust. At high velocities, even a tiny grain of sand has incredible kinetic energy and can pierce through a metal plate. It goes without saying that on a long interstellar flight, repair options are extremely limited, and a hole in the hull may prove to be fatal. In addition, a long expedition without support from Earth requires creating a closed biosphere within the starship. Scientists from different countries are currently working on this. For example, various plants have been grown on board the ISS for quite a number of years, both for scientific purposes and for consumption. In addition to that, engineers are developing systems for recycling waste, including biological waste products. However, a fully-fledged orbital ecosystem is still a long way off. The solar system is just one of the countless multitude of planetary systems scattered across our galaxy. As we know, it consists of a single star in its main sequence stage and eight planets with their satellites. In addition, our system contains over a million small celestial bodies like asteroids, comets and meteoroids. The planet in the solar system lying furthest, at least that we know of, is Neptune. Its orbit's radius measures around 30 astronomical units, which is equivalent to approximately four light hours. Amazingly, only a tiny portion of the solar system is encompassed by Neptune's orbit. The remotest object in the system discovered to date is the so-called Far Far Out, lying 132 astronomical units or 18 light hours away from the Sun. Still, even this object, barely visible against a dark background of unfathomable space, is not at all close to the hypothetical Oort cloud, whose inner boundaries lie approximately 2,000 astronomical units away from the center of our system. According to some estimates, its outer boundaries stretch for up to 60,000 astronomical units at the very least, which is around one light year. These limits are predefined by the Sun's gravitational influence, and what lies beyond is interstellar space. Moving further away, we will notice over 50 of all kinds of stars within 20 light years from the Sun. These stars are really diverse, from dim and cold brown dwarfs to bright and widely known objects like Sirius, Procyon and Altair. Some of them have their own planetary systems with objects potentially capable of nursing and sustaining life. For example, the object known as Gliese 832c, which is 16.1 light years away from the Sun, is similar to our Earth more than any other planet within the solar system that we know of. The average temperature on the exoplanet's surface reaches to 153 Kelvin or 20 degrees Celsius below zero, and it takes the astronomical body just 36 Earth days to complete a full orbit around its parent star. In astronomical standards, the distance between us and Gliese 832c is relatively small. However, a space probe setting out from our system at a speed of roughly 17 km per second would take as much as 300,000 years to reach the exoplanet's environs. At our current level of technological advancement, it is impossible to design an interstellar spaceship capable of completing as long a journey as that. The solar system, together with its neighbor stars, is part of the Orion arm, the latter, in its turn, is part of the Milky Way. It contains around 400 billion stars, and potentially over a trillion exoplanets of all sorts can be discovered there, according to estimates today. The main diameter of the Milky Way measures around 100,000 light years, and the stellar halo may be twice as large. Even though the thickness of the main disk measures about a thousand light years, there is a clearly defined bulge in the galaxy's center. 
This bulge is roughly 3,000 light years thick. The Milky Way is part of the so-called local group. This is a vast structure comprising over 50 galaxies concentrated within an area of space measuring around 10 million light years in diameter. The Andromeda Galaxy, the Triangulum Galaxy and the Milky Way are the largest of the lot. Some estimates show that the mass total of the cluster may reach as much as 3 trillion solar masses, with our galaxy and Andromeda accounting for the major part. With the distance from the Earth to Andromeda around 2.5 million light years, it is considered to be our closest galaxy not counting smaller or dwarf ones. Moving on to the next order, the local group forms part of the giant Virgo supercluster, made up of over 30,000 galaxies. The supercluster is located within an area of space with a diameter of around 150 million light years. Its mass total is as much as a quadrillion solar masses, or in other words, around a thousand galaxies like the Milky Way. The supercluster is quite flattened and around 60% of all the objects it is made up of appear like a flat sheet around 10 million light years thick. Staggering though it may appear on the face of it, this value is actually small in terms of the large-scale structure of the universe. As we zoom out still more, we have a chance of seeing a giant supercluster of galaxies approximately 520 million light years in size. Called Laniakea, it includes several galaxy superclusters, among others the Virgo supercluster and the Great Attractor. The overall mass of this formation measures approximately as much as a hundred quadrillion solar masses. The Great Attractor lies roughly 250 million light years away from our planet and is the gravitational center for all objects lying close by astronomical standards. It cannot be observed from the Earth directly as the Milky Way is plane thwarts it. That is why the nature of the Great Attractor still remains an unsolved mystery today. Laniakea is part of the large-scale structure of the universe, an elaborate system of galactic filaments, walls and voids, gargantuan areas of emptiness and space. Some of these objects are really incredibly enormous. For example, the Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall stretches for around a staggering 10 billion light years. Ever since its discovery in 2013, this superstructure has been considered the most gigantic component of the large scale structure of the universe. To all appearances, it must be home to millions of galaxies, and the number of stars it contains will probably always defy calculation. The mere existence of a structure like that is a mystery to science, as according to today's accepted theory of universe's evolution, gargantuan clusters like that are simply not supposed to form. But incidentally, this wall, so enormous that the human brain cannot fully appreciate its dimensions, is still just a tiny portion of the observable universe. According to today's cosmological notions, space in the universe is continually expanding with the speed of expansion depending on the distance between objects. The further an observed object lies away from the observer, the faster the distance between the two increases. The rate at which the two mutually recede is not limited by the speed of light, because it's actually space matter that is expanding, which means that at a certain point the two objects will be mutually unobservable. Relic radiation observation shows that the area of the observable universe is a sphere, with a diameter roughly 93 billion light years. According to the theory of relativity, we can see and interact with only those objects that are within this sphere. This conventional spherical area in space is called the Meta Galaxy, and it may be either all of the universe, or again its tiny portion. For all we know, hypothetically, there may well lie some unknown structures beyond the visible boundaries of space. Such entities are referred to as extra-metagalactic objects, and unfortunately it is impossible to study them today with scientific methods. Still, some astronomical bodies on the edge of the visible universe appear to be moving in ways different from what we would naturally expect, judging by the data we have. Instances of anomalous movements like those may be evidence of the presence of some massive structures 
beyond the matter-galaxy boundaries. Their attraction pervades the space around and influences objects around too. There is a whole plethora of hypotheses as to the structure of the universe beyond the matter-galaxy, but most of them are rather of metaphysical nature. For example, some people believe that time and space, as we more or less know them, are non-existent beyond the boundaries of the universe. The physical laws we are used to do not apply there either, and notions of matter, material or energy are virtually senseless. This hypothesis is further elaborated on by the following idea. The meta-galaxy accounts for just a part of a yet more complex and larger scale superstructure in space whose makeup and dimensions are too incredible for us to imagine. It is quite possible that this structure could be in a multidimensional space, or else be based on physical principles we have no idea of. This makes the meta-galaxy just an insignificant addition to, or a partial reflection of, this mind-boggling superstructure. According to some interpretations of the anthropic principle, there are other worlds out there beyond the boundaries of the observable universe. In those worlds, the values of the fundamental constants like the speed of light or the electron charge are completely different. This hypothesis is in many ways supported by the idea of a multiverse, which schematically appears as foam with lots of bubbles separated from each other by thin walls, but these walls are impenetrable. This makes every universe a separate space, with its own physical laws, and for all we know, these laws may be totally different from the ones we are used to. The most radical hypotheses go as far as to deny our world any objective reality whatsoever. According to these, the universe is just a simulation like virtual reality in computers, but on an incredibly advanced level. As a rule, Ideas like that imply that there are some super-beings, or super-civilizations out there beyond the reality we are used to, whose level of advancement is infinitely higher than ours, and whose goals and capabilities are arcane and incomprehensible. However, it goes without saying that it is hardly possible to either confirm or repudiate these hypotheses. Of course, distances in space defy our imagination and are even frightening. They appear infinite from the point of view of any person today. What we do know is that the universe is expanding and provided this process continues, there will come a point when space objects will disappear one after another beyond the event horizon. First galaxies, then stars, and the world will immerse in eternal darkness. But by then, there will be no one around to witness that. The famous American writer Ursula Le Guin expresses her own thoughts through a character in her book in these lines. The word must be heard in silence. There must be darkness to see the stars. The phrase has to do with the birth and death of all that exists. Every object in the universe has its beginning and its end. Some subatomic particles last as little as tenths of a second. Some microorganisms live between two hours and several days. Man's life expectancy counts several decades. But even stars eventually burn out after millions and billions of years of existence. And what about the universe itself? Is it also going to come to an end at some point? What will it be like? And what will happen after its death? The earliest theory of the genesis of our world is what is known as theory of the stationary universe or steady state universe. Supporters of this theory claim that the universe has no beginning and no end. It has always been and always will be in its steady state of equilibrium. However, very soon scientific estimations proved this theory likely to be wrong, as there are some irreversible processes taking place in the universe. In the 1910s and 1920s, the Big Bang theory was formulated and widely popularized. Today, it is one of the most consistent scientific theories, and it is able to account for the universe's genesis and evolution. Dozens of scientists contributed to the development of the Big Bang Theory, 
and Albert Einstein's works on the general theory of relativity laid the theory's foundation. The main conclusion this theory enabled scientists to arrive at is the supposition that the fate of the universe depends on dark energy, a theoretical type of energy causing space to expand. Be it as it may, at this point it is quite impossible to say anything definite about this physical phenomenon. There are a great number of theories about this, and each of them has its praiseworthy aspects and shortcomings. According to data we possess today, the age of the universe is calculated from the moment of the Big Bang, and is estimated at slightly less than 14 billion years. The universe is constantly expanding, and depending on the density of dark energy, it will either expand forever at a regularly increasing rate, or else the expansion will slow down and reverse. In this case, the universe is bound to compress into an infinitely small singularity, similar to what it originated from. Today, science is not ready to give a definite answer to the question which of these two possibilities will prevail. However, it is ready to suggest at least two equally possible scenarios of what may happen next, referred to as the Big Rip and the Big Crunch. The universe's expansion rate is proportional to distances between objects. The further some objects are located from each other, the higher the expansion rate. Imagine a balloon pumped with air. There are two dots on it. If we pump still more air into the balloon, the dots will get further away from each other. That's the way the expansion of the universe works. It is space itself that expands. The further the dots are initially located, the faster they get still further apart. At a certain point, this rate exceeds the speed of light. This point is known as the event horizon. All objects beyond it disappear from view and they drift away beyond the reach of the most advanced telescopes, never to be observed again. Just imagine. First, the remotest galaxies and clusters will disappear from the sky. Then, one by one, the Milky Way stars will fade away, and to crown it all, it will be the turn for our sun to go dim. What a gloomy sight. If the Big Rip theory holds good, the universe's expansion rate will be constantly on the increase. This will lead to expansion forces gradually overcoming gravity forces. Following that, first galaxy clusters and then galaxies themselves and star clusters will be broken up. After that, it will be the turn for stellar systems to disintegrate, as host stars will not have sufficient pull to keep their planets and satellites from floating away. At the next stage, matter will be reduced to atoms and these will be reduced to subatomic particles. Matter will effectively cease to exist. After this, physical laws as we know them will cease to be, and any further developments are quite impossible to predict. Observations today show that space expands and the expansion rate is on the increase. However, we are not familiar with the nature of dark energy. It may well have properties unknown to us at this point and these may reverse the expansion processes. As a result, the universe will start contracting. This may well happen if general gravitation created by all matter in the universe exceeds its expansion force. This scenario is what is known as the Big Crunch. In this case, processes in the universe will run in the same manner until its size decreases five times. Galaxy clusters will come together as one supercluster which in essence will fill the entire universe, considerably shrunk by this point. Meanwhile, inside the galaxies, events like births and deaths of stars, planet formation and so on will keep taking place just like before. When the universe contracts 20 times more, its volume will account for just 1% of that of today's and all galaxies will blend into one. The relic radiation temperature by that time will measure 274 degrees Kelvin and it will still continue to grow. This means that there won't be any liquid water left in the universe and water is vital for biological life as we know it. Further contraction of space will cause the universe to heat up even more. Planets will first be burnt and then melted. All matter will crumple into an enormous cloud of boiling plasma. After that, atoms and subatomic particles will disperse and eventually, the universe will collapse into a singularity similar to the one it used to be when it was born. There is a theory which is a kind of a spin-off of the Big Crunch theory. 
It is known as the Big Bounce Theory. According to the Big Bounce Theory, on reaching the state of singularity following the Big Crunch, the universe will be reborn as a result of yet another Big Bang, and the cycle will repeat itself again and again, supposedly forever, as far as it is possible to speak about eternity in conditions devoid of time and space. I will repeat myself yet again by saying that our knowledge about dark energy is too meager to speak about the duration of any of these scenarios. For all we know, the next big rip, or big crunch for that matter, will take place in a period when there are still stars and planets around. But what if it isn't the case? What will happen to the universe if its ultimate fate is still extremely remote in time? Still, the laws of physics imply that the universe as we more or less know it cannot exist forever. There are four clearly defined epochs in cosmology and each of them is associated with this or that particular phenomenon. We live in the so-called Stelliferous Era. There is a lot of interstellar gas in the parts of the universe around us. It is used as raw material for stars to form from. New stars are born from this gas and the process will continue until all interstellar gas has been depleted. This epoch is expected to be over in the period from 1 to 100 trillion years from now. By that time, the Sun and the overwhelming majority of other stars will have depleted their nuclear fuel, subsequently turning into white dwarfs, neutron stars or black holes. I've actually already spoken about it in an earlier video. The next era is known as the Degenerate Era. There will not be any main sequence stars around anymore. Most matter in the universe will remain in the form of white and brown dwarfs and some matter will persist as neutron stars and black holes. It will take a great amount of time for all these objects to cool off, around a duodecillion or 10 to the power of 39 years. White dwarfs will gradually give off their heat in the form of radiation and become black dwarfs. As for brown dwarfs, they will cool off too. Thermonuclear reactions taking place in their interior at a sluggish rate will eventually stop completely. Gradually, most matter will be slurped by black holes. At this stage of the universe's evolution, dark matter annihilation and protons disintegration will be the major processes. The proton is a subatomic particle that atoms known to science are built of. It is considered one of the most durable subatomic particles. Its life expectancy, as it were, accounts for approximately a hundred duodecillion, or 10 to the power of 41 years. Now, by the time this era comes to an end, matter in the universe will look like a great ocean of freely floating elementary particles with an occasional neutron star or black hole tucked away among them. The next era is the black hole era. According to some theories, black holes will form clusters and eventually blend together thus forming one single gargantuan black hole. Alternative theories suggest that black holes will slowly evaporate while emitting energy before vanishing completely. Black hole evaporation is a quantum effect produced by what is known as Hawking radiation. The smaller a hole, the more intensive its evaporation, which eventually strips the hole of all its matter and energy. This process is supposed to persist for 10 to the power of 100 years, this number is also referred to as Google. Be it as it may, eventually only dead expanses of space will be left in the universe. This space will contain debris left over from processes having taken place in the previous epochs. Photons, electrons, positrons, neutrinos and quarks. Electrons and positrons will collide, thus causing annihilation. The universe may exist in this state practically forever until the next big crunch or big rip at the very least. Either way, the humanity will be long gone at that time. Its existence is likely to be terminated in the Stelliferous Era. Our planet, meanwhile, will remain habitable for another billion years or so, and after that it will be burned by the ever-intensifying glow of the Sun. About five or six billion years later, our Sun, by then a red giant, will shed its outer layers and become a white dwarf. But what will happen after the universe dies? Disappointing as it is, there is absolutely no way we can answer this question. The trouble is, whatever the scenario, there won't be either time or space as we know them. 
even if the Big Bounce theory or the Big Crunch theory is right, or else a new Big Bang takes place, thus giving birth to a new universe with a fresh set of galaxies and stars we will simply never find out. Just like we will never find out what it used to be like in the universe before ours, because the word must be heard in silence. There must be darkness to see the stars. The universe is made up of countless objects bound together by the inexorable laws of physics. While in one part, celestial bodies steadily orbit their stars for billions of years, violent outbursts in another one wipe out entire stellar systems in a matter of seconds. We only see a minuscule part of the incredible diversity of the cosmos, and in its depths there lurk many more great mysteries and riddles. And this means we'll enjoy many more fascinating journeys into the depths of the universe.